There we go. Welcome out to the Tackle Training Halftime Report. Guys, ladies and gentlemen, I got two amazing guests here today, Coach Noah, Coach Gino from uh, Tackle Trading, and they're here to join us on Friday Fun Day. I'm going to go ahead and drop my screen here. Noah, why don't you go ahead and share? Let's get right into kind of what we're going to be chatting here today. But first and foremost, welcome out to the Halftime Crew at Tackle Trading. We appreciate you guys coming in here on a daily basis and, and going through the markets with us on that daily basis. Kind of the overall plan here today, uh, Noah and Gino, is kind of walk through the market. I want to get your guys' take on, you know, the Bulls, the Bears, who's winning that battle, what your read on it is in, in the overall marketplace. Obviously, I want to go through the market indexes, crude oil, the dollar hitting its uh, hitting its target, uh, you know, gold and so on and so forth. But then I want to get into the RSI indicator because you guys demand it. We are going to bring uh, in it and it won the vote. We got to get more people voting over there at Tackle Trading, but it did win the vote. Uh, and so we're going to cover the RSI indicator later on in the show today. Uh, Coach Noah, Coach Gina, how are you two doing today? I'm fantastic. Awesome as always. How, Gino, I want to get your take first here. We're looking at the S&P 500, Gino. In, in the pre-production show today, you were talking about reversal indicators that you're reading, that you followed, and, and you expect this market to snap back and start rallying because of that. Gino, can you talk a little bit about the reversal indicators that you're looking at? Yeah, so this time of year, Matt, is my favorite time of year because we usually get a dip between September and October. We've been talking about it every week for our last, what, seven, eight weeks in the market scoreboard saying prepare for the September dip all the way to October. Get your uh, costumes ready for the October rally because you want to be a bull at the end of October when you put that costume on. Right now, I got the bear costume on still. So what that means is this. This is seasonality. So as the market is bearish, it is bearish across the board and all the indexes. Uh, we see that in the market scoreboard. If you look at that every week, you see it on the charts, you see volatility. What we're looking for is reversal candles, reversal indicators first, and then second, a confirmation of the uptrend. So number one, I look at internals, looking at those, we'll go through some of those. And number two, Noah's got a great thing on basic price action, what price do we need to see broken before we actually confirm it's an uptrend? Just because we get an update doesn't mean, oh, we're bullish now. Just because we uh, have a hammer candle. But we're going to depends on how aggressive, yeah. So, yeah, let's go through those. All, All right. right. Well, okay, here's, here's the question I got for both of you two, and I'll answer as well. Right. At what price level on the S&P 500 are you buying? Because you are, we got to love – the snapback in the in the market after the GDP. I'll go first. I'm looking for a, a lower pivot, a lower high swing high. So right now that's sitting at 28. Oh, where's that line up there? That that look at that hammer up there, Noah. A little bit higher. Where is that hammer way up there? 2800. Is that what it is? A little higher. Out right right here. There. Yeah, that's that's that for sure would be above the moving averages and the high swing high. But do you see any minor pivots below that, Noah? Well, let's see. Um, I might change time frames if I'm looking to be aggressive on entry. Two hundreds in the way. Two hundreds a simple one. That'd be a simple point to cross. Um, I've got a you know a trail stop here on a hedge. So if as soon as it starts to move up, I'm starting to unwrap some of those things. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's aggressive. That's about as aggressive as you get um, right there. And that's actually just a trailing stop on a hedge. But uh, I would say at a minimum, I want to see prices back up above the twenty period moving average. Do you agree we're at the bottom of the channel? I, I think we're at the bottom of the channel right now. Yeah. Uh, well, let's look at that. No, I, where did we tick down at the low today? Today's low was 20, uh, 2,627. So 2627.25. Okay. So from, from the very top to the very low here, we got about 2806 to 26. You're, you're talking about a 200 point range there, guys. Yeah. I would say you range down on that. Absolutely. Oh yeah, absolutely. Something I was looking at just comparing and contrasting was I was measuring up the previous drop, this one back here in February, January, February, and just mm -hmm. comparing it to the current drop. It's not nearly as dramatic. Um, you know, it, it looks pretty scary and steep, but uh, February and April was a little bit rougher overall as far as well, the I think it also had a little bit higher percentage to drop down into that 200 day moving average. Because if you'll remember guys coming out of 2017, we were showing massive momentum. <laughs> to the 
Oh yeah, it was way, way, way overbought for sure. Yeah, and so, and so, yeah, the steep decline was just. A, it was a little bit because we had such a great year in 2017. You know, it was just kind of churning here this year, so a little bit of a less steeper decline. But you know, from from peak to trough here, I think you're you're what now 10 percent down in the S and P 500. You're you're entering correction territory. You know, I I, I certainly think we got to be hesitant here. I I don't think anything aggressive on the buy side is appropriate until you start. Not to see yet. Not yet you start to see a little slowing momentum but what would it take for you guys to be aggressive because from a day trader perspective i'll tell you right now i'll buy anything above 2700 on the s p well i yeah. love i love being a contrarian at these drastic levels and that's what i'm saying is there's two kinds of uh indicators i use matt one is trend indicators because most of the time things are trending and i don't know if you've heard this before but or at least once a day you hear it um trend is your friend trend is your friend and once you identify the trend, right, like right now, guys, all the moving averages are pointing down, except the 200 starting to turn over. We're below all the moving averages. So that every, every indicator that follows trend is bearish. But mm -hmm. there's also the second indicators I follow called overextended. And that's when you get into the Bollinger's, you get into the stochastics overbought. You get how many different overextended things are there, Noah? I mean, I don't know. More, more than we have yeah. time for. Oh, right. there's, there's, there's still got to be 50 to 100 different indicators that have. Yeah, so you got to you got to divide them up. Which ones are trend indicators? Which one are overbought, oversold? Because you don't use oversold and overbought indicators for trend primarily. You use use them for overbought. So that things are overbought and oversold. That happens a lot less than things that are trending. So right about now is when I start looking at, okay, this is really far off the moving averages. I might want to throw a Bollinger on there. I want to throw, throw my, what's the other one we use uh, quite a bit? Well, I can't think of it. The channels, the- Keltner the, channels? Yeah, the Keltner channels, all those different ones. And you got to pick one and run with it. So, and Noah, you and I were talking about this many years ago, how you actually widen your Bollinger Bands because when it goes outside your Bollinger Band, it's definitely overbought or oversold because it's wide. Oh, yeah. yeah. So where's yours sitting at right now? Well, I don't have a Bollinger Band on my chart, but we could go pop one on there. I, I certainly like a Bollinger Band. It's a good envelope system. So let's go add one in there. Good old Bollinger. There's a lot of different bands like that, but is that one of your well, favorite? The default setting is two deviations, right? So, yeah, so a default setting on, on two deviations. And anytime you're riding the lower band, the, you know, when I met John Bollinger many, many years ago, Gino, um, I know you, you have the office just down the street from him, but uh, he, he taught me this, the basic system with the Bollinger band and the RSI. And so, you know, you'd be looking for, you know, when you're touching that outside of that band, there's a really high probability you get a revision to the mean, which is just a, a run back up a retracement. But you're looking for that Bollinger band, you know, down right in the bottom, and then the RSI to be oversold um, down below, well, you know, the 30 line. And you're looking for that revision to the mean. So I'd say that anytime you you get outside the Bollinger band, the probability of a revision to the mean starts to increase. Well, okay, so let's talk about this. And absolutely. I'm not going to play too much contrarian here, but any revision to that mean, Noah, I'm looking to short, not buy. Oh yeah, no, I'm not. Yeah, for sure. If you're just looking for a short-term rally, because whatever revision to the mean you get is is going to run into 20-period moving average support resistance zones. It probably is going to come back down. And so, you know, if we're seeing a reversal, it's, yeah, go ahead. Let, let me ask a question then. Obviously, we're not there for looking to buy the S and P 500 at this point, but we would look to go look for stocks that are in bullish uptrend, sitting at support there you level. Go. And we expect the market to go up. Correct. There right. You go. Go, yeah. go find the stuff that didn't get beat. Um, yeah, take, that's a lot like, more logical. Yeah, I mean, in, in, again, you're not looking, you're, you're not analyzing saying the entire market is going to go up. You're looking yeah. at this from the market being overextended. And I love the fact that we're putting Bollinger Bands on and we have the RSI and the MACD and Stochastics. Every one of those indicators are going to show they're oversold here. But if you'll just look at something that we have used for years and years and years, and if you just look at potential average yield, from the, from the very peak to the trough on that first initial drop down, Noah, that we had in early October, that went about 240 points from 2945 down to about 2710, right? Oh, and yeah. then you had a retracement come back into that 20 day moving average, which was short term, but it was a retracement. 
And then that from the peak to the trough went about 200 points. So, so if you just look at from a pure price level perspective, you're starting to get into those over oversold zones as well, especially as it dipped today. And then as it was dipping today, guys, and I want to get your take on it, it could have got real ugly today, guys. And, and, and I'm very happy that the market recovered in her day, but it could have gotten nasty, ugly today. That GDP report, I mean, we had Amazon get slaughtered on earnings. We had Google get slaughtered on earnings. Those were two that are uh, two market darlings. The FANG stocks are now in bearish territory. But but in, in terms of that, at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, we had a really, really positive GDP report, in my opinion. Expectation was 3.3. Yeah. It came in at 3.5. Consumer spending across the board was up about 4.1%. It, it was a really good GDP report. Without that report, this could have got ugly. But with it, gave the market a little bit of support. I expected to come back into uh, those uh, resistance channels. Well, let me put it to you this way. If I was a bear and I saw that GDP report, I'm buying to cover. Oh, and that's exactly what happened today. Exactly. So I don't think this is bulls buying in on a Friday. No, no, no. there's no bulls buying in today. This is bears buying to cover because they've been winning all week. Now, there are some people that might not understand what what that means, Noah, because when they see the price going up, they're they're probably, especially somebody who is relatively new, they might be thinking, oh, man, people, there's a lot of volume coming in today. There's a lot of people must be buying this. And it's like, uh, for the old time traders, we're like, hmm. Nobody's making that aggressive of a stance in a bearish downtrend overextended coming into a Friday, right? right? So what does buying to cover mean and how does it impact price, you two? Well, you got to remember um, the, the general mechanics of the market. And when you get into a downtrend like this, the, the, the short sellers are borrowing shares or, you know, and they're borrowing and selling them. And so they actually sell to open. And in order for them to close their position, they have to buy to cover, and so that initial buying, this is, you know, this kind of cracks me up. People always complain about short sellers, um, mm -hmm. you know, driving the market down, but they, they forget that they're the first ones to prop the price up. Mm -hmm. They also forget that they're the ones who keep the price from going too high in the first place by being contrarians. So bears closing trade, they're buying to close, but it's, you can't really differentiate between um, somebody who's buying to close and somebody who's buying to enter. If you were to go look at, you know, the time and sales, for example, and watch those orders coming in, you can watch those buy orders come in. You can't tell the difference between, you know, who's buying the cover and who's buying to open. But my assumption is, is because we've had a bearish week and it's a Friday that people buying right now aren't, they're not bulls looking to get in on a discount. They're, they're bears buying to close and, and close out for the weekend, ring the bell, go home. Okay. So let's put this into, into, you know, the, the conversation here. You two, I know have shorted stock this week. I have shorted stock this week. Our halftime crew has shorted stock this week. And what are all of us going to do coming into the weekend? Well, look at this buy stop I have right here on my chart. That That's right there is an indication. You're buying to cover. If it goes any higher, I'm, I'm buying to cover, not because I want to, because it's hitting my trailing buy stop. You have to. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. So, you know, what's your, what's your take on, on, on this? I know we're, we're popping some reversal indicators here. You were talking about the trend and other things. Um, but from, from an overall mentality yeah. perspective, are you holding things through the weekend right now? Uh, Matt, on basic option strategies where I'm out of the money and I wanted to be out of the money, yeah, definitely. The weekend's where you do that kind of stuff where I'm selling options. So mm -hmm. there are strategies. Like right now, I'm a big uh, proponent of actually doing bull puts out of the money on a bounce. That's aggressive. You know, it's aggressive. It's advanced strategy, great cash flow strategy. One of the number one strategies done in the option world. Um, every professional option trader I've talked to in the last three weeks has just been loving the premiums and loving their condors, but they're way out of the money because you can do it. Now, as far as directional trading, like you said before, it's aggressive to go bullish here. It's aggressive to play that snapback rally and it takes precision. So timing, catching the bottom is a very dangerous act. Trying to catch a falling knife. There's so many bulls out there, Matt, that just, yeah, I want to play this bounce. But that, like we said before, make sure everybody hears it. We're not going bullish indefinitely on we play the bounce. We're just playing a short-term snapback. And where does it snap back to? Well, you can see there, it hits its head on the moving average. It hits its head on the last resistance. But what leads me into this, Matt, is that I'm really good at predicting bottoms and turnaround points. But then again, it's taken me 20 years to perfect it. Mm -hmm. So I'll run you through three charts that help me time a bottom. And I'll use one basic indicator. I'm not going to get into the advanced stuff. And, and this is lovely because uh, 
you guys use this too. This is why you have to be in Forex. Like the market, where did it top out there, Noah? Where did it top out? Oh, it says. 27.47. Yeah, what date was that? That's the uh, you, You're talking about. mid-September. No, the very high, the high of the market. Yeah, it was mid-September. The high is 920. Remember that date, 920, okay? Now watch this. Let's go look at the dollar. Let's go look at UUP. And when we look at UUP, I'm going to throw a Bollinger Band on there. I have this on a screen, by the way. I have about seven or eight charts on a screen. Why, I don't, we let, why don't we let you share your screen so I don't have to? We well, can do that. okay. Let me see. Well, I got the UUP. It bottomed out about the same time. There you go. Put the Bollinger on that. Now, throw the Bollinger on that. My, that's my overextended indicator. Notice how <clears throat> the Bollinger went outside of – the Bollinger, the dollar went outside the Bollinger around 920, 921, right? That tells me it's overextended. And what does it do it after it usually rallies up? Now, a lot of times the dollar will go the opposite of the market. So if I know the dollar is going to rally, that usually gives me the odds that the market's going to drop. And that's the exact same date the market dropped, right? Now let's go back that up with another reversal indicator. What's the bit? Now that that's the dollar. That's the biggest catalyst of everything, okay? It creates a ripple. The whole world fills it. And the Forex, the commodities, the bonds, then the stock market. Because the dollar, the Forex market, as Matt's our expert in Forex, he'll tell you, it's, what, 4 trillion times more volume than the stock market? About 5.7 trillion. Yeah, five point, that's, a, that's way good. That monster. So that's the first thing I look at, especially if it's overextended. And you can pick tops and bottoms very easily by looking at the Bollinger Band on that. Very easily. Now let's look at the second big indicator the vix the vix is a very professional market that makes these prices it's an insurance market called the SIBO. now these guys price the options accordingly now what do they do they try to price them high or low and they overprice them they over exaggerate and this is the option market which means they study the stock prices they study volatility and then they price it in. So when these prices get overextended, let's go look at 920. Was there any indication that the VIX was too cheap? So 920 is where? It's right there at the low end of the Bollinger. That, that's, that's October. We got to go to 920 right there on the line. You can see it right there on the outside the Bollinger. Right there, yep. So it hit the bottom of the Bollinger. What does that mean? Overextended to the downside. So I had the dollar on 920. I had the VIX on 920 all telling me, hey, this could snap back. And that's where we put the market high in. So there's a lot of indicators like that, Matt, that I look at. And that's, that's one of my, my two favorite. But that means the exact opposite. Now, should I throw one more in there? By all means. Let's put the trend. Let's put the trend. Put a dollar sign in front of that trend. Yeah, let's go look at 920. What, where was it at around 920, 919? The trend was way below 0.5. You can see it right there. 920, right, right there. Right there. There is 919, 920. What is that? So the, this predicts the market's going to reverse. The next day, what did it do on 920? Reversed. Well, let, let, let's take a step back very, <clears throat> very quickly, Gino, and explain exactly what the trend is for those that maybe don't use it or don't, is not familiar with it. The trend is simply looking at the advanced decliners every day and looking at the volume. And it says, okay, based on the advancers, how much volume's in there? Based on the decliners, how much volume's in there? When the ratios aren't one-to-one, -one, basically imbalanced, that means there's too many buyers or too many sellers on one side of the boat. Everybody's gonna shift to the other side of the boat and dramatically reverse. So isn't it odd that this one usually leads? And so that was 919, and what are the other two indicators? 920, and where do we put the top in at the market? 920, 920 921, right? So showing you where the market topped out at, that's what was telling me back on the scoreboard, guys, this could be our September sell-off we're waiting for. We do the seasonality. Now I'm looking for the October rally. So what do we have here? Well, yesterday or two days ago, we had it just over two, but it didn't hold. I would like to see this get over balanced above two, or below 0.5. Now we were there today. See down today, we, we hit 0.5. We're slightly imbalanced at, at the middle of the day. Well, the middle of the day, the first hour here. And then if you go look at the same indicators, what are we doing now? 
we're overextended on the upside, which means the market should rally. Dollar so, hitting so, resistance. Mark yeah, so if you look at the UUP now, now yes, yeah, so that's the trend. We're not, now it's corrected itself pretty much today, but go look at the dollar and look at the VIX and see where we're at. Are we overextended? So here's the dollar. There we are outside the Bollinger Band, come inside in today. Then you look at the VIX and there we are. We're outside it this morning. Well, and whenever the, the market does its correction, I always look for the VIX to pop out of the Bollinger Band and then retest it. It almost always pops out and then retests it before it finds a bottom. Right. So the odds are we could rally from here, Matt. So this is how I pick bottoms. It'd be a short term bullish play. And then you look for, okay, if the market gets over the 20 and these guys break their 20 line, which is that middle line there, then you start looking for the trend to confirm itself. So picking bottoms, there's a science to it, guys. That's my three favorite indicators. I have a lot more. I use something called a shark okay. fin, which let, let me say there, right? all of this. I'll though. tell you, it, it's paid off. It puts the odds in your favor and it pays off. So no, and, and I certainly agree with that. But all of what we have just done is an indication that we're going to do a snapback rally for the next two to three days coming back into 2750 on the S&P 500. Right. Unless there's some news that comes out. Of yeah. Week. So it's short term in, it, in its predictive value or not necessarily predictive but anticipatory value. It's mm -hmm. not long term. It's short term. So. We expect the market to kind of rally back up into resistance. Let's go ahead and look at the S&P 500 very quickly. Let's identify what those key levels are for everybody. On an intraday basis, ladies and gentlemen, I want everybody to write this down. It's the number that is a trigger above and below, and it's been that way for days now. 2,700 on the S&P 500, ladies and gentlemen. You get up above 2,700, I fully expect that rally to continue into 2,750, which is where I put resistance levels and yes uh jasmine no doubt about that uh news impacts economic reports geopolitical news impacts all probability 2700 is an intraday support intraday resistance with the market underneath that level that is a trigger for me on the on, on the buy side 2750 is the zone i'm looking at as your your major level of resistance that between 2750 and 2770 is right where your uh, where your 200 day moving average is as well so look for the market if it does recover from here and i do expect it to recover for the next couple of days those levels are going to be very very important to watch but noah and gino i'm going to tell you right now we rally into 2750 and doji i'm shorting the market again that's that's well, well, yeah, I, I can picture it right here coming into that zip code and then giving us another drop. But this is the one I'm expecting to be more like a double bottom or this is the one I expect. It, to be it, yes. Higher before. And so I want to see that higher low to really give me that confidence. The market's reversed. Well, up. And, and no, do me a favor. Let's let's I, I don't know. Th I don't know if we can go back this much time on the ES. We might have to do the SPX. But last week I looked at the market from the comparison of the 20, uh, 2007 drops compared to the 2018 drops. And if you'll see that in 20, 2007, we saw these types of situations happen. So I want to go back just to kind of look at that market, just to show you a little bit of what Gino, Noah, and myself are talking about on that daily uh, on that on that daily basis. So if you're looking at this on a day after day, let's go uh, back to 2007 there, Noah. All the way back in time to 07. Gotcha. Right. Wow, that is an awesome chart. Okay. Check it. Now, if you'll look, if you'll look at that 2007, you had your first drop to test the 200 day moving average there in February and March of that year. Then you tested it again, got underneath the 200 day moving average, similar to what we are looking at right here. And what you're looking at in my estimation is something that could be very similar to what we're gonna go through over the next couple months there, Noah. If you'll look at that June, July type price action, watch it dip down, snap back rally, come back into that 200 day moving average, consolidate the volatility, and then you break out of 1500 and you ran back up to the tops. And I think that's something to keep an eye on here as we rally back into those 200 day moving average to see if it comes back down and support holds. At that point, you could see that rally coming in in November. And so that's something to keep an eye on. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I always look back at these patterns because um, I think that's the general pattern the market goes through when it goes into a correction. Mm -hmm. And so and they're common patterns so i absolutely agree with that i, th I do think it snaps back i think we'll end up retesting the highs eventually well e even, even if all the volatility okay 
look at just the summer, July, August, September, coming into those months, guys, that is an inverted, an inverted head and shoulders on the S&P at that point. And so if you're looking at the market today and you're saying, wow, this might snap back. Well, yes, I expect this to snap back and then have it come back down, retest support to see if we form some type of reversal pattern. I don't anticipate a V-shaped a V-shaped uh, recovery here. I think it's going to be volatile, but I do believe we were re- I do believe at this point we will recover. We will see the all-time highs again before we have a disastrous 2019. Oh yeah, and you look back at it. I mean, every correction since, um, if you go back and look at you know the market rallies and the recoveries, um, 2010, you'll see that same, same basic, same exact same thing. thing. So, you know, inverted head and shoulders there. And that was probably one of the, you know, the scarier corrections of the market early on in the game. You'll see that oh, pattern. We were so early in the recovery. We were yeah. so early in the recovery. You're absolutely yeah. right. Absolutely. So, you know, so it's not uncommon thing. to see the, the big 2011. Hit. Look at this. Yep. And, and, and the news in 2011 was worse than the news in 2018, guys. The news in 2010 was worse than the news in 2018. Now, the key difference is we were pumping trillions of dollars into the market in quantitative easing, and now we're raising interest rates. But if you'll remember back in 2011 specifically was the European debt crisis. And that thing, if you wanna talk about volatility, watch the market go up and down four and four and a half percent every single day, right? I mean, it was just absolutely crazy. But again, look at that. In the rallies, you came back up into resistance before you tested the lows again. Now, Noah, if you look at the S&P 500 today, you're seeing the very beginning of that same type of situation. And you need to give it a little bit of time to play out here, but you're seeing that initial drive down and then you're seeing that initial support level kind of formed there on the S&P 500. And I'll, I'll give you the number on the S&P at the low here, Noah, but you're seeing that initial support level formed there right around 2630 in the marketplace. Expect that to snap back into resistance, come back down into support, forming that W or that inverted head and shoulders. I mean, think about this. Let's play a couple scenarios out here. Number one, it snaps back into 2750, comes back, forms a W. That's number one. Number two, it goes all the way back up into 2800, comes back down, test support at 2750. And then all of a sudden, that's that head and shoulders formation. So so I do believe it's bearish today. Obviously, we're in a bearish, we're in a, a bearish trend. But there's a lot of scenarios, including seasonality, that could have a reversal formation happen over the next couple of weeks to give us a really, really, really good buy signal coming into the holiday season. Well, it just, and it dawns on me, Matt, that you're doing something that I think traders do start to do well after they get really comfortable and confident with their technical analysis cycles and patterns. They're, they're playing chess. You're thinking two moves ahead. Mm-hmm. You're, you're already ahead of the, what the market's doing. You're, you're looking at the conditions now, anticipating the rally, anticipating the drop, anticipating the rally. Like you're literally three moves ahead um, of the market and, that, and you're watching for that confirmation of those patterns. There's an old, there's an old movie and it's a famous statement. It's a, it, it's a great movie and it might be Pulp Fiction, but I, 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 need, to, I need to look at it. He says, we're playing chess, not checkers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, trading, uh, tackle trading in the halftime crew. We play chess. Everybody else plays checkers. Yep, chess, not checkers. Gina, what's your take on all of it? I I agree fully exactly what you're going through, Matt. And yeah, that's what it's all about is thinking two moves ahead. And and more, more important about that is once you get to that level of thinking two moves ahead, what the difference between trading and, and checkers or chess is, is this. If you're wrong on that outlook, you got to get out. Okay. So Mm -hmm. if you're expecting this and you're expecting that, if it's not happening, don't stay in there, reverse and and wait for that. As soon as you just like, well, I guess you can't say I have played chess with some very good chess players that were in their teens and they're on the chess club. And I'm like, ah, they're teenagers, right? Man, they're thinking four or five moves ahead. And I'm like, what's taking you so long? You already thought about the four moves ahead. Why don't you make your four moves? You know what they said? Well, I didn't expect you to do that. So now I got to change up those four moves. I'm like, oh, so I did a move you didn't think. So now you got to think four moves on that. So every single day when you plug into the market, you got to say, okay, was this what I was expecting? Is this going to hurt my position? Oh, it is. Okay. I'm out here. Let me rethink this. And while you're rethinking it, you don't stay in, you get out. 
Um, you know, that's the thing is you're not going to be right every single time, but the odds are in your favor. And I agree exactly with what you said that that's probably what could happen. Even though my reversal indicators say this is going to reverse and all this stuff. They're not a hundred percent. They're tried and true and they, they work in the long run, but they're not a hundred percent. Any well, come out this week. There's so many variables that could impact this. Yeah, right? Hurricanes. You got, I mean, so many variables out there, but I, I still believe that Burnings. this I think the, the Twitter time. variables alone are potentially more <laughs> well, you know what you know what's amazing though is I had a student say, hey, this is outside the Bollinger and it's reversed like nine times out of ten. So it's gotta go back to the center. And I go it's the, it the tenth time you gotta love that. Yeah. yeah. But here's I go, I go, but earnings is tonight. And they said, Yeah, so should it snap back to the center? And I go, it's 50-50 on earnings, flip a coin. Ignore yep. all the indicators on news. Ignore but it's all Amazon, Gino. Oh, it's God, pull up Amazon. You got to pull it up. Right? You got to pull it up. Speaking of which, guys, let's look, go ahead and look at the NASDAQ very quickly. Took its head, took, uh, took a beating overnight. Oh, I mean, man. Amazon down, a, down 10% overnight, down 8% currently. Um, you know, the Google missed on, missed on, on, on revenue as well. I mean, just the NASDAQ took it on its chin overnight massive recovery intraday guys what's your read here well this follows the pattern i always expect on a on a correction which is a big drop followed by a smaller drop that's i that's the pattern i'm always looking for on on market corrections because that's that's just slowing momentum mm -hmm. and and when you see that you'll notice like an indicator like the macd the histogram starts coming back up and when you see that histogram coming back up that's that's a sign of that slowing momentum and so I think that the, the market's not as scared as, it, as a lot of people think. It's down overall, but it is still slowing down. And if you look at that intraday, you're going to be seeing an intra, like a inverted head and shoulders pattern forming intraday. If you're scared as a trader, you shouldn't be trading. Right. Right. Correct. Read it. React. Position size accordingly. Um, what's your guys take on Amazon and Google here? Let's go ahead and look at those two, yeah, uh, those two charts for a second. People don't realize... I mean, Amazon has come out of the ashes here. Look at the price. We're talking, let me give you a little example of how expensive Amazon really is. Um, it hit $2,000. Do you guys realize that was more expensive than the indexes were a couple years ago? Okay. <laughs> so basically, if you look at Amazon as 2050 and then, you know, what is uh, S&P? It's only another 500 points above that. Well, think about this. It's at 1671. The ATR, the average daily move on Amazon is bigger than the S&P. The, the ATR on Amazon is bigger than the market. So a lot of people are actually day trading it if they have you know, enough money in stocks or they, the big day traders because they're getting huge movements on this. So this is a very dangerous product to be trading because you're trading something that's as expensive as an index. It is a company. And guess what? Companies can gap down very, very big, have runaway gaps. Can this go bankrupt? It's totally possible. Can it lose 50%? Yes. So when it pulls back, well, how much of a percent is it already, Matt? What's, what's 20, 50 to 16? It's uh, 10%. Is that Actually, no, no, excuse me. Uh, peak to trough, 20%. 20% in a month. Their territory. Ay, Dios mio. So if you, if, you, if you put that next to an index, it is really underperforming the indexes. I mean, you don't see the indexes. Well, Russell's down 17% off the high. Indexes are primarily down 10. Fang stocks are down 20 plus. Yeah, Russell's the worst. It's down 16 or 17, but this is 20%, guys. This is very, this, is this a recession in Amazon? No, it's a strong company. They just reported they're going to have like $10 billion worth of advertising sales and all this other revenue, but it's correcting. So if you don't know how to, you don't have a stop loss on this or you're not protecting yourself, You've got to be careful. If you're in here on earnings, you're just crazy. This, this is, I mean. Well, let, let me ask you a question, guys. Amazon does not hit its 200-day moving average very much. No. So God, when was the last this, time it did that? Is this a buy opportunity for you guys? <sighs> yes, but here's how I would play it. I'd be selling like way out of the money put spreads. Puts. Yeah, I got it. Exactly. And then taking those like an profits and maybe parlaying the purchase like into like buying out of the money calls. Like way out. Like, like way $2,000? Yeah, like way out of the money, $2,000 calls longer term. So can um, we call that kind of a, well, a, a four-voice trade? Yeah, it's not a four-voice trade. 
and and let me reiterate very quickly, guys. Whenever you hear us talk about poor voice trade or whatnot, we're we're basically using cash flow off the sell of something to buy something that we usually wouldn't buy, <laughs> like right. deep out, yeah. like deep out of the money call options, correct? Yeah. Using a high probability cash flow trade to go buy your lottery ticket. That's basically <laughs> that's, that's basically what it is. Great. We've got license plates in my family that say "poor boy." Okay, so we do anything <laughs> we can that's cheap. You know, so here's oh, a don't thing. get me started on that one, Gino. <laughs> <laughs> just just move, move the field. So, so here's the thing on on Amazon. Like I said, it's like an index. It's hard to day trade because you might get margin on it it's really hard to day trade as a stock trader. So stock traders, when they start looking at prices like this, they're going to go do the S and P and do the futures and stuff. When things start getting this high, the best way to play these kind of stocks is an option trader. And this is like Noah said, this is your advantage to do those condors and credit spreads and out of the money spreads. In fact, myself, Matt, you know, I've got quite a few accounts uh, more than I really want to manage, but here's the thing. I, when stocks are over two, $300, it's mostly credit spreads for me. It's mostly vertical spreads, credit spreads, and things that make the trade less risk and higher rewards. So there's a lot of great opportunities with this if you have options. So let let well, me try to convince okay. you too, okay? You tell me yes or no. Go to, go to, to the uh, Analyze tab, no. I wanna go out 56 days. Oh, I like this. I'm going to go out 56 days. 50. And I want to sell the 1400 put. And I want to buy the 1390 put. 10 point spread. Look at me right clicking. That's a little right click action right Tim there. Tim is, is right not liking action. that right now, but I no, love Right click action. I like it. Okay. And when you said 1390. I'm bringing it back. Right? Yeah, 1390. A little 10 point spread. Okay. Um, hey, you're getting a dollar credit on, you're basically getting a 10% ROI, 282 points out of the money, sitting at an overextended Amazon post earnings at the 200 day moving average. What do you guys you know, think? With, with a delta of nine and a probability of 87%, um, I like it. I think that that's, that's a beautiful thing. The price dropping increases and it's plus it's early enough after earnings. You haven't seen the whole volatility drop. So I think that that's a decent trade. Gino. Absolutely. I, 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 I was looking at that myself, Matt, and uh, you're saying 56 days. I was actually looking a little bit of shorter term, but yeah, I mean, your Delta, maximize range. I like Delta's under 10, especially when I see reversal in the market. So if I time the reversal in the market, just those two plays alone, playing the reversal in the S&P, the Russell and the Amazon, that's a great trade going into the weekend. Why? Because you get all this weekend of decay, time decay. Mm -hmm. And the volatility drop on Monday, if the market rallies, you could be out of this Tuesday, Wednesday with a pretty good profit. No, if the market, if Amazon rallies back into say 1800, right. you're closing that trade in two, three days. Right. And then I'll look for a swing high to do the, the call side. Okay, so what about Google here, guys? Let's go ahead and quickly look at Google. Google, another company that got uh, got beat up overnight on earnings, but guys, absolutely snap back rally here on Google. He's recovered the loss in the drop wow. already. 65 points interday movement to the top side. What you guys read here on Google? Google has been beat up more so than a lot of those other you know growth based uh, fang stocks out there. What you read here? Well, I think it's a slowing momentum pattern down there at the bottom of the channel with increasing buying volume down here. Yeah, and a one, two, three, four, five wave countdown. I'm all in. I think you just wait, did wait, wait, oh. wave, We just went <laughs> we just went deep dive on Elliott Wave and that's about what it took. Elliott Wave. Hey, you're on wave five, I'm all in. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm all in. I'm all in. Oh yeah, okay. and we're in the Hold Virgo on. Virgo Moon, right? So yeah, yeah. Is gonna... this a buy opportunity? I'm going to give you guys a number, yes or no. Above this level, is this a buy a uh, buy for you? Eleven fifty. Google gets above eleven fifty. Could that oh, trigger yeah. above yeah. yesterday's high? Yeah, above that or the pivot or maybe the twenty period, two hundred period moving average. I think you got to get above the pivot at eleven 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 fifty. I don't like that two hundred in the way. But I mean, would you would you gonna, even hesitate to sell a put spread clear down below nine hundred? Oh God, look at that no, one. Look at that one. Let's go look at that. Look at that. Whenever we're confused on anything technically, we sell put spreads. <laughs> That's what we do. My God, I'm doing naked put sixty percent out of the money. Again. Yeah, I don't have a read. 
I, I remember one time, okay, I was, I was, I was doing a little bit of over analyzing, as you guys know, I can do every now and then. And I'm sitting there kind of talking to Tim for about 45 straight minutes about this and this and this and this. And Tim says, and I won't, I won't use the colorful language that Tim used, but he said, Matt, will you just sell a five Delta and shut that up? And I'm like, yeah, I'll do that. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out which word you left out. Oh, there was a couple of choice words there. I know, that, uh, a couple that, of options. Yeah, I liked yeah. it. I liked it. But, but no, it, 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 to me, it made a lot of sense because a lot of times as an analytical, we can deep dive into things and we overanalyze. And here's my creative genius brother saying, Matt, sell a five Delta. It doesn't matter. You have 90% probability. Come on, what are we doing here? And so I did, you know, so whenever, whenever in doubt, sell a deep out of the money put option on Google. Okay. But just cover it with, a, with credit spread. I like it above 1150 here, guys. And, and the reason I've been pretty bearish on, on Google. I remember back in the halftime report, I gave a little passionate argument on the bearish nature of Google but if you get back up above 1150, you're back up above the previous pivot, you're back up above the 200 day moving average and you're back up above the 20 day moving average, which is obviously a trend reversal there. So I kind of like it at that point, but definitely I think a more conservative way would be to uh, do a deep out of the money put spread like we were looking at. The weekly chart on Google looks really good. Would you guys agree? That's what I'm bringing you there for. Just that beautiful I do hand. love how you curved your trend line there a little bit. But when I draw my trend I, line, I draw them how I want <laughs> for my confirmational bias. So that is a trend zone for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I, I love the weekly chart here, guys. I mean, Yeah. You don't get a lot of opportunities, but I do like that. I think the trigger still is above 1150 on that though. All right, let's move on, Gino. I want to get your take very quickly, guys. Only about three minutes, rapid fire on this. Crude oil, give me your guys' read. Gino first. Uh, let's go look at it. I, I think it's long-term, it's at a neutral point right now. Um, with the dollar snapping back, I expect the dollar to drop. I see this bouncing. So again, bull put. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so basically, when all else fails, Matt, bull put out of the money. We just support when things fail, bull put out of the money. Ten deltas, <laughs> love it. Um, I, I I still have my one third position size on here. I, I'm not going to do anything unless it breaks down under sixty five. No, any take on that? Yeah, no, I agree with that. I actually I, think this is something we talked about in the in the coaches lounge this morning. Oh my god. Um, we talked about a correlation between the dollar and, and oil. Right. And it doesn't, it doesn't, it'll stay negatively correlated for a short period of time before they both revert back to the mean. So dollar up, oil down, there's a high probability they revert both to the mean, which means oil up a little bit, dollar yeah, down. Yeah, a pairs trade there. Yeah, it's a, it's yep. a pairs trade. Okay, looking at the uh, dollar very quickly, guys. Uh, trigger above 96 worked, went up to about 96.93. Hit its head at resistance, looking for a short-term uh, short-term correction on the dollar here, guys. Right. I'm still bullish on the dollar. I do believe it's going to correct and retrace back into 96. I don't think we need to say anything outside of that. To, it was overextended, hitting its head at resistance. Look for it retrace back into support at 96, and then there's going to be some potential trades there at 96. We'll look at that obviously next week and then last uh, last thing in the market sky, skyline portion here i want to look at is gold gold is uh showing a little bit of reversal over the course last uh, month or so hitting its head um and if we'll just look at kind of that immediate short term uh, short term here noah you gotta like what gold's been doing over the course of the last few weeks boys i gotta ask you matt you're the commodities guy and you're the dollar guy is this a bottom in gold right there is that a rounding bottom you gonna put me on the spot here? Oh man, we got the personal gold system coming up, man. Per well, I'll tell you what: when we put out our products, it's always perfect timing. We put out Bear Market Survival Guide a month before the market topped. Now we're about to put out Personal Gold Standard. So, is this perfect there, timing or what? There is a reason that we release products at certain points, guys. It's because market market conditions, technical conditions, economic conditions, monetary policy conditions, all of that going to line. So is there a reason I'm putting out personal gold next month? You're damn right there is a reason. And yeah, that, that to me, that is a bottom in, in the short term. It's close enough to a bottom for me. I mean, it's a long-term uh, investment, Matt, for me. Mm -hmm. So anytime I get this way off its highs and closer to the bottom, commodities, commodities for me, just like any commodity professional will tell you, is commodities when they hit near all-time lows or multi-year lows, they buy them. And why is that? Because they pick bottoms 
uh, because they don't go bankrupt. They don't go mm -hmm. bankrupt and it's a portfolio hedge. And notice what date, Noah, did this bottom one is the last bottom on this? <clears throat> I'm just going to guess. October or September 20th. Is that yeah, about yeah. it right there? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, I, I will say this on, on, on gold, you know, and it's something that we all believe in out of everything in the paper assets, digital marketplace, there's only one thing that can't go to zero and that's commodities. Right. But you know, but here's another thing, Matt, what about the gold rally as dollars been going up? That's kind of odd. It, it's, it's shown relative strength. It, it's shown relative strength. Um, it's very, very rare that the dollar and gold will move in line with one another. But over the last couple of weeks, they have been moving in line. That's telling me that there is strength coming into safety, guys. The dollar, the yen, the Swiss, gold, silver, um, natural gas, utilities, uh, consumer stable companies. There's money coming into safety because of the concern of the overall market. Yeah. So guys, plug into the commodities report this weekend because platinum also is hitting lows. Yeah, I got I got the commodities. They pulled me off currency this week. I got uh, I got commodities. So are you gonna um, put platinum and palladium in there? Oh man, oh man, I'm a, I'm gonna go all Pete Thomas platinum and palladium. Heaven, yes, I'll, oh. I'll do a deep dive on all of it. Probably do something. Uh, you know, my my writing style and whatnot. I usually tell a story <laughs> or something. But uh, no, uh, you know, the, I, I'm gonna have fun with the commodity report. I know you got the scoreboard this week. Tyler has the options report. Grant oh, has the uh, stock report. We're gonna have an Absolutely, absolutely great reports this week. And I'm looking forward to that two o'clock meeting that, you know, Gino, myself, Noah, and the rest of the coaches do a tackle train going over those reports. We're going to, we're going to put the time in, make those reports absolutely great here. Guys, we're at the halftime point of the uh, market skyline, uh, halftime, uh, halftime crew, tackle train, all that jazz. Uh, typically, uh, when I run the show here, halftime means 45 minutes and not the 30 minutes. Tim's much better on that. Uh, but if guys, if you like the conversation, if you're learning something, make sure to give us a nice little like and share, tell somebody about it. Now, guys, I want to move on coming into the weekend, Friday, fun day. We put out a Twitter poll out there. Need more votes, by the way, halftime crew. But we put a Twitter poll out there and the people spoke and the people I mean by just a few people, but they did speak loudly. And we're going to look at the RSI indicator. So I want to do about just 10, 15 minutes here, guys, just teaching the RSI indicator, what it is, how we use it to uh, help us secondary confirm trade decisions, overbought, oversold conditions. So Noah Davidson, the author of all things technical analysis, master technician, take it away. Well, I, I was just getting set, set up here to pull some of the volume. Oh, should I, did, should I have done a, a, oh, no. a better intro? No, that was a perfect intro. I don't need a better intro. I just wanted to set it up with a with an RSI at the same mm -hmm. time with a with set of Bollinger bands because I think they're a really good combination um, to put together there. So RSI, I think, is just a, it's one. You have to understand um, how a lot of these indicators were created. RSI was developed by a guy named Wells Wilder, probably one of the original um, you know technicians out there. You know, wrote a lot of these really popular indicators back in the seventies. And you know RSI is a very very you know powerful um, oscillator. It's it's it was kind of the original oscillator. So the general idea is is a relative strength index tracks the closing price over whatever time frame you set it to. The default setting for a lot of these is 14 days, and it's tracking your closing price over 14 days and whether it's closing above the mean or below the mean. And in this case, the it goes on a scale from zero to 100. Fifty dollars is the middle. And then it puts overbought out at 70 and oversold down at 30. So if it, if it moves up too much, you'll see it poke out the top of the RSI. If it moves down too much and gets oversold, you see it poke out the bottom. And you'll look at how much time does it spend outside those, those high you know, and low price thresholds when things get overbought or oversold. It does not spend a lot of time out of the extremes. So it's, it's really, really good at helping us identify um, revision to the mean when you get things overextended, overbought, oversold. So it's very, very powerful indicator. Is there any particular stock you want to look at on it? Like well, we were just let's, let's have the halftime crew give us some of their yeah. stocks, and we'll use the uh, RSI as a secondary confirmation just to kind of help understand, you know, trading triggers and you know, and so on and so forth. Overbought and oversold. A couple things to point out here, Noah. Um, you, you know, you mentioned that a lot of these indicators use the RS, and not the RSI, but they use 14 days, right? Yeah. Now, same thing with ATR, same thing with a lot of those indicators that were created in the 70s and 80s. 
why is it that the default setting is 14 days? So I do have a great story about this. My mentor and one of your mentors, Jeff Crystal, um, he met a guy called named George Lane. And George Lane wrote the Stochastics Indicator, which was a sense, in essence a ripoff of the RSI. Mm-hmm. So he met this guy named George Lane and he says, hey, George, hey, George, why 14 days? And George said, well, I never told anybody to set it to 14 days. That's just the, the somebody else's payday. It comes down to back in the 70s, the average market cycle between support and resistance was 14 days. The markets mm-hmm. have sped up a little bit. Right now, the average is about eight to 10 days. So if a 14 day RSI is a little loose um, for a lot of, of systems, but it just comes down to, it was a setting based off of the data, the, the average number of cycle, the average number of days in a cycle back when they created the indicator. And mm-hmm. almost every trading, software I've looked at over the last 20 years has, has RSIs and stochastic. All the They're all set at 14 because that's what we got put into the stocks and commodities magazine, you know, mm-hmm. article written about the RSI back in 1980s. And yeah. everybody's still using the exact same settings. Well, and it doesn't make any sense for us to adjust to an eight day RSI if nobody else does. Right. 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 I, I mean, it works because people use the defaulted settings. Uh uh-huh. Well, that's one of the things, the same thing with an ATR. Everybody's getting the same data, the same number. Nobody's really changing it. Mm-hmm. You can uh, you can put on um, adaptive, AT, you know, things like that. Like uh, Jeff used to create indicators that would automatically adjust the, the date cycle so it would match. And it would give you a slightly better timing than everybody else. But I also want to see what everybody else sees. Mm-hmm. So if I was going to if I was going to use an adaptive RSI or, or to shorten the time frame on it, I would also want to see the 14 day. So I can see what other traders see. Same with the ATR. I, could, I don't see there's much of an advantage to, to speeding it up because you want to see mm-hmm. the same data set everybody else does. But yeah. I'll tell you what I do see on this is here on the rut was the first one that came up. We got a, a small slowing momentum pattern outside the, the uh, Bollinger Band and you have a small divergence in the RSI. It's out down below the, the 30 and that's rising. Even though the price dropped, the RSI is rising. Now, That's very cool. quickly on that, guys, when you see, and, and what's happening here on the RSI, and this is a really good divergent type pattern here, when you have decreasing momentum in the trend, like we are seeing in the Russell 2000, and you have increasing RSI here, that's called divergence. Usually that means the rut will drive back up into resistance, correct? Right, it'll probably run back up and revert to the mean. And that's, I mean, that's really what you get is anytime it gets overextended, it can ride the upper band for a while, but eventually it reverts back across the channel. I so, love that divergence on the rut. That, that is oh, yeah. a, that's a positive signal. Well, go check it out on something like Google where we were saying, hey, does Google rally out of here? You know, check, check out um, the, the overall condition where we're, we're gonna be outside the band on the bottom and you have got a really good that's divergence, a good divergence right too. There. Oscillator divergence happens when prices slow down. You see slowing momentum pattern, you will see oscillator divergence. Which is a buy signal. Right. Yes, there's a lot of ways to use that RSI, you know. Um, no, that, we were talking like Bollinger Band is reversal indicator. Here's another one, same as Stochastics and MACD. But yeah, that 14, you got to remember, if it's not working on your stock, then you might need to change the number. So I was looking into that and Jeff and I were talking, we go year way years back. Um, check this out. If you don't know what number to use for your advanced players out there, if you're like, well, I'll try the 15 or I'll try the 16, you know, you're gonna have to back test to see which one actually fits. <clears throat> so what I do is just to make things simple, look at your major moving average that you use. Mine is the 20 day moving average. Mm-hmm. So I'll turn the RSI into a 20 day. So they all give confirming signals. They don't um, conflict with each other. So if you turn the RSI into a 20 or 21, which is actually more popular. Which, which slows it down. That means which, it's clear. Yeah, it's more of a trend indicator. That means you're not gonna get as many overbought, oversold. And another thing I read into the Wilder is this. When it crosses 50 to the upside, that confirms a bullish trend. When it crosses 50 to the downside, that's when he changes well, yeah. trend to bearish. Because that, that's the mean. That's the middle of the data set. So right if it's, there. If it's yeah. above the 50, you're, it's closing on average above the mean. If it's below 50, it's closing yeah. below the mean. Right. And so, Jasmine asks a really great question in there. Is RSI a lagging indicator? Um, 
I've read many, just about every book on technical analysis I could get my hands on. And I've read many a book that call things like stochastics and RSI leading indicators. And that's just a bald faced lie. That is. There's very few. They use historical price action. No, to there is no, the there's no such thing as a leading indicator. A leading indicator is a crystal ball. All mm -hmm. indicators I are lagging. It's just a matter of how much they lag. Inter and you, interest rates. Yeah. Um, interest rates and economic reports are leading indicators. Leading indicators. But yeah. that's it. Yeah, you know, that's the closest it. thing to a leading indicator you're going to get is Fibonacci. The halftime report. That's the closest thing. <laughs> really yeah. yeah. Halftime report and your guess. But here's the thing. But Fibonacci will give you a guesstimate of the future. But Elliott Wave tried to do that. But it's wrong more than it's right. Here's the thing is what is the 50 mean? All it means is this, if it crosses 50, if that RSA is at 41 right now and it crosses above 50, what it's telling you is, well, you're on 14 days, that uh, anything above 50, it's above the average price for the last 14 days. And, that's, and that's all listen telling to you. what I just said, just five minutes, 10 minutes ago on Google. If it goes above 1150, that's a buy signal. And guess what RSI is gonna do if Google goes above 1150? It's crossing the 50 barrier. There you go. So that, so what they're doing is, is really, it's intelligent Wilder. I mean, what is this guy? This invented this one in the seventies and it was on paper. Check this out. If it goes above 50, that's his first indicator that it's a bullish trend. But if it gets over 70, it's overextended. What he's saying is this above 50, you're probably bullish, but if it's over 70, you're getting into the trend a little well, late. Yeah. And let me, let me rephrase something very quickly. The trade signal that RSI helps out the most is on a breakout, okay? Because everything we're looking Absolutely. at, everything we're looking here is the divergence that leads to the breakout, that leads to the reversal, that leads to the breakout. Yep. What RSI helps us understand, ladies and gentlemen, is if we do see that breakout at 1150 and RSI is between 50 and 70 with a positive slope, that tells us that puppy's ready to run, correct? That's right. That's okay. right. So, and if the RSI right. is over 70 on the breakout, it gives you a moment of hesitation to get into the trade. But if RSI is above 70, it doesn't mean I'm going to automatically get out because like Noah indicated, RSI can stay above there for a while. You just don't want to trigger into a new trade at that point. Yeah, you're late to the party if it's over 70. It's still bullish. It's very strong bullish. It's just you've missed most of it. So where are you in your trading style? Are you the one that well, I'm taking this if it breaks above 30 because I'm playing the bounce, the retracement, or am I taking it when it turns bullish at the 50? Or do I play the end of the strength at the 70? There's three possible uh, bullish entries. I, I think what are you? We, we could overanalyze it, or we could just sell a delta of 0.05. Out. <laughs> just sell yeah, that flight there delta. There you go. The cash flow. <laughs> okay, um, just but no, no, let let's me, just make money and sell the five delta. Let me answer Gino's question. When do you pull the trigger? You don't pull the trigger based on RSI. You pull the trigger based on the close above 1150 and RSI is that secondary confirmation. There you go. Confidence that Google will has room to run on top of that. There you go. Price action first. Price action always. Price action always. So what to take away, guys? Above 50, under 70, on a breakout, that's what we call confirmation. Under 50, above 30, breaking support, that's what we call a sell confirmation. Over 70, overbought, under 30, oversold. Divergence is when you see slowing momentum in the trend. So the trend is coming down, but slowing. But the RSA, RSI indicator now has a positive slope on support. Google is doing it. That is an indication of a trend reversal. And if you liked our conversation on the RSI, you boys and girls know what to do. Like and share. Final thoughts, Noah, Gino. Final thoughts coming heading into the weekend. Oh, it's Friday. I, my attention span, I've already changed. I'm already focusing on like football. So we got to go. The youths. Oh, and you, you, you name it. We got, we got, we got world series tonight. Yeah. We yeah. got the Dodgers. Have all to win all the best, all the best. You know what's right. going on with your Dodgers, man. LA you know, Kings. They like to do this. They like to make, you know, they want to make sure they bring it to the home field because they like to win out there. They don't like to win in Boston. It's too cold. You know, I saw Poog. You're a trader. You do know that <laughs> if they win three games in LA, they still have to win one in. I know Boston. that's what sucked. But here's the thing: I can't see Puig in his little hoodie under his hat. That was just funny looking. It was too you know, much. No, he doesn't like the cold weather. I could take it, you know. But it just didn't look funny. You can't swing the bat with that thing on. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, maybe maybe we we'll, we just full of home run hitters. It's fun to watch. But you know, LA, we we've got plenty to do out here. 
man, I'm looking at my notes from today. We got so much to take away. Um, I only got a few words written down in my notes. All I have to take away is sell the Delta of a fifth, five. That's it. <laughs> sell the five Delta. That's all my notes. That's it. Uh, everything we said, the Theta King himself, Gino says, so, well, I, I got I got it. I'm selling a bull put on, Del on Google and Amazon at a five Delta. I like it. I like it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's been the halftime report for Tackle Trading. The scattering reports will be amazing tomorrow. Stock, Forex, commodities, and option reports. Market scoreboard comes out tomorrow as well. The, uh, the email will be sent uh, on Sunday as always. So, guys, and until uh, Monday, we will see you bright and early Monday for the halftime report. But we got an absolute big week. Noah Davidson's finishing up the second session of technical analysis 101 on sunday so if you're a pro member over there make sure you are supporting no no i've heard so many compliments about your first session absolutely great job uh, by you have an absolutely great session on sunday as well and uh, outside of that guys it's all about scouting reports on on the weekend guys we'll see you on monday to cover the market again thanks everybody we'll see you on monday you